Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Um, Alhamdulillah, we are blessed today to have with us um, Sidi Abu Munir, uh, Ashar, and uh, Imam Zaid Shakir um, to talk about the life of Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani. Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani, he died in the year 2006. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him. He lived a long life of service to the Muslims of Damascus and the Muslims of Qatar and um, through his students, Muslims all over the world. Um, he, was the, uh, he was a fellow student. So all of the three scholars that you see on the screen here, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Shaghuri, Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani, Sheikh Shukri al-Muhafi, all of them were students of uh, Sheikh al-Hashimi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, one of the great scholars of Damascus. And, um, and uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman was a successor of Sheikh al-Hashimi in Damascus. And when he passed away, his uh, place was taken by, uh, uh, his place was taken by, uh, his place was taken by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Sheikh Mustafa. Um, and when Sheikh Mustafa passed away, his place was taken by Sheikh Shukri al Luhafi. Sheikh Shukri al Luhafi, we already we did a an event on his life uh, with um, uh, Sidi Abu Munir, um, and uh, we did, we did we did an event on his life with Sidi Abu Munir previously, and many of you attended that. So this is a follow up to that um, uh, to that event, and. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit about Sheikh Mustafa. So um, I'll um, pass it, hand it over to Abu Munir. And uh, Abu, Sidi Abu Munir was the personal attendant of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, all three of these scholars. And so he has many um, stories to share about them. Um, and so he'll begin, I'll translate, and then Imam Zaid will, uh, will pick up uh, from there, inshallah. Sidi Abu Munir. Um, so there there's a number of uh, um, there's a number of questions that we received um, before uh, before the session, one of the session, one of the questions was, how did Sheikh Mustafa, um, how was he authorized by uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Um And so we'll begin with that, um, and today Abu Munir will relate that. Naam Sidi. Ana sawfa atakallam yani bi ba'd daqaiq hatta la akhuz waqt Sidi Imam Zaid, wa la ufasfil kathir bihadhi al-nuqat. Inshallah, Sidi. أجيز سيدنا الشيخ عبد سيدنا الشيخ مصطفى أجيز من الهاشمي إجازة شفهية وهو في عمر سبعة وعشرين سنة قال له الهاشمي سيدي مصطفى أنت مرشد كامل. الشيخ مصطفى had an had an uh, an authorization to spiritually guide other people when he was twenty seven years old. Um, he was a student of Sheikh Al Hashimi, and Sheikh Al Hashimi addressed him verbally, and to, and said to him that Sidi Mustafa, you are a uh, completed spiritual guide. هذه نقطة. 
النقطة الثانية أنه في عام يمكن يصحح لي سيدي إمام زيد 95 96 لا أدري يعني في هذه الأعوام قريب من هذا العام اتصل بي الشيخ نوح وقال لي أنا في أمريكا وسألني بعض الطلاب أين يدرسون العلم الشرعي فقلت لهم يذهبوا إلى دمشق فهل ممكن أن تساعدهم في تسجيلهم في المعهد المعاهد الشرعية فلم أرتح أنا يعني الفقير في ذلك الوقت لتسجيلهم في المعاهد الشرعية لأن المعاهد الشرعية فيها علوم شرعية وفيها علوم أخرى فتحولت بتوفيق الله سبحانه وتعالى إلى الشيخ مصطفى ولم يكن هناك إلا معرفة سطحية جدا من بعيد um, uh, so, um... Uh, so, um, Sibu Munir came to know about uh, Sheikh Mustafa through Imam Zaid. Um, so, um, Imam uh, Sheikh Nuh uh, Keller, he called um, Abu Munir while Abu Munir was in Damascus. And he said that there are a number of students of knowledge um, who want to seek uh, religious knowledge and I want to send them to Damascus. Um, so, can you help? And uh, can you help register them in a religious school? Um, and uh, so uh, Sidi Abu Munir, he asked around for, uh, he, didn't, he didn't want to register them in a religious school. He wanted to put them under um, the guidance of a religious scholar. And um, Sheikh Mustafa at Turkmani um, came, to him, came to his mind, but he only had a, uh, a very superficial relationship with him. He didn't really know about him. He didn't know about Sheikh Mustafa that much. <laughs> أحد الشيوخ الذي بيننا وبينه علاقة في حينا وقلت له نريد أن نطلب هذا الطلب من الشيخ مصطفى بأن يقرأ العلم لطلاب من الغرب فأريد أن تساعدني في ذلك ذهب معي ودخلنا إلى بيت الشيخ أظن أنا أول مرة أدخله في ذلك الوقت وطلبت منه قلت له أنا أبو منير عرفه الشيخ هذا عرفه قال هذا أبو منير والده فلان وهو عند الشيخ عبد الرحمن الشاغوري فأخذت الكلام وقلت له لنا إخوة في الغرب يريدون أن يطلبون العلم فوفقني الله أن أطلب ذلك منكم ماذا تقولون؟ قال نحن جعلنا الله سبحانه وتعالى دعاة إليه فإن لم نستطع أن نذهب إلى أمريكا لندعو إلى الله لا نبخل على أحد جاءنا من هناك أن نقدم له ما يريد فتفاجأنا في هذا الكلام الإيجابي منه وفرحنا كثيرا وقال أهلا وسهلا عند مجيئهم نجتمع بهم إن شاء الله so, um, Sibu Munir didn't have um, he, he, he didn't know Sheikh Mustafa um, uh, so he entered um, upon Sheikh Mustafa. He entered him, he visited him um, through the intermediary of another Sheikh in Damascus. And he went to him and he just uh, expressed his need to him. He said that there's some students of knowledge who are coming from America. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, um, has given me the tawfiq to come to you to ask uh, you to teach them, to read um, books with them in the way that books are taught traditionally from teacher to student um, in traditional circles of knowledge. And, um, and he said that, that Sheikh Mustafa, his response was, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us people who call to him, who call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we can't go ourselves to America to call people um, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and somebody comes to us all the way from America, we're not going to um, withhold from them. And, uh, and so uh, he, uh, he agreed immediately. قال كم عددهم؟ قلت تقريبا تقريبا عشر عشرة أفراد. قال وهنا عرض عرضا 
يجب أن نقف عنده وقفة يعني ملية عرض عرضا قال أنا أجلس معهم خمس سنوات أنت معي سيدي حمزة؟ نعم سيدي كأنهم كأن الحضور لا دقيقة كان 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 everybody can everybody hear us can can you see us okay نعم الحمد لله أف أف أنت ذيك جاءني رسالة أنه لا يمكن أن أن نرى لكن نرى نعم سيدي تفضل فعرض عرضا يعني أول شيء قبل أن يعلمهم وهو قد يعني امتنع في دمشق عن كثير من التدريس أما أما قبل هو العرض هذا ثم عرض عرضا آخر وقال أنا أجلس معهم مع هؤلاء العشرة خمس سنوات الليل والنهار أكل معهم وأدخل المطبخ معهم ونتعلم ونقرأ معهم ونلعب معهم وندخل إلى السوق معهم خمس سنوات أبقى معهم ليلا ونهارا يسمحون لي بنصف ساعة في الأسبوع أذهب بها لقضاء حوائج أهلي من الحوائج وأرجع إليهم وأبقى معهم خمس سنوات حتى أطمئن أن بعد خمس سنوات أرسلنا إلى أمريكا عشر شيخ مصطفى <laughs> um, so um, he said, um, so Sheikh Mustafa, he didn't, um, he didn't just, uh, he didn't just agree to uh, to teach them, but he said, he said that he made an offer, and he said that we should think about this offer. He said that for five years, he said that for for five years, I will live with them. I will eat with them. I will drink with them. I'll spend all my time with them for five years. And I just want to ask for them for half an hour, half an hour, once a week, I'll go back to my family, take care of my family. The rest of my time I'll spend with them. And after five years, there'll be 10 Sheikh Mustafa's that, that I'll send back to America. لكن كان هناك ما يمنع لذلك أن الإقامة في دمشق كانت يجب أن تكون على معهد شرعي فكان لابد من تسجيلهم في الجامعات أو في المعاهد الشرعية لوجود الإقامة فهذا العرض ذهب وبقي بقيت نية الشيخ وأجره عند الله لكن هو ذهب هذا العرض أن يقيم بينهم ليلا نهارا خمس سنوات um. The, but at that time, there was a rule in Damascus that um, you couldn't stay in Damascus without formally registering in a religious school. So um, because of that, in order for them to, in order for the students to stay in Damascus, they couldn't spend all of their time with, uh, with Sheikh Mustafa. They had to go to a religious school. And so the offer that he made, um, it was, they were unable to, um, uh, to take advantage of it completely. وكنت بصحبة سيدنا الشيخ عبد الرحمن في الطائرة فأخبرته أردت أن أخبره بما حصل بيني وبين الشيخ مصطفى وبين الإخوة الذين يقدمون من الغرب فقلت له هكذا يعني الله سبحانه وتعالى وجهني فأحببت أن أطلعكم على ما جرى فقال لي قال سيدي مصطفى منذ 25 سنة وأنا أريد أن أجيزه في الطريق so um, he said that he uh, told uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Rahman al um how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had inspired him to um, arrange uh, these sessions with, uh, with Sheikh Mustafa for these students. Um, and Sheikh Abdul Rahman remarked that for 25 years, I have wanted to give Sheikh Mustafa an authorization to be a spiritual guide in a spiritual path. Yani <laughs> have التاريخ يكون بعد وفاة الهاشمي تقريبا بعشر سنوات أو أكثر أو أقل يعني بوقت قريب جدا من وفاة الهاشمي والشيخ عبد الرحمن يقول أنا أريد أن أجيزه من ذلك الوقت أين هو؟ قلت هو مسافر كان والآن جاء إلى دمشق 
فسر كثيرا بهذا So uh, Sheikh Mustafa used to uh, used to be in Qatar and he recently returned to Damascus um, around the time when he began uh, teaching uh, uh, Imam Zaid and others and so uh, he was uh, so he said that I've I've been wanting to give an give author where is he and so uh, Abu Sidi Abu Munir said that he was in um, he was traveling and he res- and he returned very recently and so um, Sheikh Abdul Rahman was very pleased وكنت اذهب معه في بعد صلاه الفجر الى بيوت اخواننا امام زيد والاخوه الذين كانوا معه يذهب الشيخ مصطفى الى بيوتهم ليقرئهم صفحه من من القران وشيئا من السيره لابو الحسن الندوي um, سيدي ابو منير used to accompany Sheikh Mustafa um, because Sheikh Mustafa used to go to teach the students in their houses um, and Uh, and he would he would uh, teach them a page of the Quran they would recite and some from the seerah of uh, of Sidi Abu Hassan al-Nadawi لماذا سيدي كان يذهب اليهم ولا ياتون اليه يعني لو قلت منه يعني تواضعا لو قلت منه يعني لمعرفه الظروف حتى لا يكونوا غربيين يتنقلون في في الحي بوقت ال بوقت مبكر وهذا ربما ياتي عليهم بمشاكل فكان هو يقول انا اذهب اليهم حتى لا ياتي اليهم يعني مشكله. I asked why is it that he would go to the students and the students wouldn't come to come to him which is uh, the normal uh, way in which somebody would learn from a teacher said that it's it was partially because of his uh, humility and partially because um, he he was concerned for the welfare of these western students who've shown up Uh, and so if they're moving around um, in a suspicious way and at in the early hours of the morning um, they might uh, be questioned and so he came he, he used to come to teach وكلما ذهبت معه ذاهبا وايبا يقول لي يقول لي او تاتي ياتي ذكر الشيخ الهاشمي فيقول يا سيدي الهاشمي رجل كبير فقلت سيدي هل تعرفون الهاشمي <laughs> قال نعم فتجرأت اكثر وقلت له هل جالستموه قال نعم فتجرأت اكثر قلت هل اخذتم الوردة منه قال نعم تجرأت اكثر قلت هل دخلتم الخلوة عنده قال نعم والحمد لله وقال لي سيدي مصطفى انت مرشد كامل وكان عمري 27 سنة <تصفيق> so, um, nobody knew uh... about Sheikh Mustafa. Sheikh Mustafa, uh, nobody knew about Sheikh Mustafa's association with Sheikh Al-Hashimi. He'd been away from Damascus for a long time. And uh, so Abu Munir would go, uh, would accompany him uh, when he would go to teach, teach these Western students of knowledge. And he would, um, he would, uh, he would say, um, uh, while they're coming, he would, they would um, speak about uh, Sheikh Al-Hashimi. And he would say, Sheikh Al-Hashimi is a great man. And so Abu Munir um, would ask him, he said, did you know Al-Hashimi? He said, yes. And then he said that he was emboldened. And then he, after a while, he asked, did you sit with him? Did you learn from him? He said, yes. And then he was emboldened a little bit more. And then he said, did you, did you take the spiritual path from him? And he said, yes. Um, and then he said he was emboldened a little bit more. And then he said, did you enter into a period of solitary remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him. It's one of the methods of spiritual training. Um, he said yes. And then he said that, that, uh, that when I was 27 years old, uh, I, I did that when I was 27 years old, uh, uh, Sheikh al-Hashimi said to me, uh, Sidi Mustafa, you are a, a completed spiritual guide who can take other people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وقال لي, قال الشيخ الهاشمي كان يدخل الخلوة لمن أراد أن يدخل الخلوة إلا أفرادا هو طلبهم للخلوة لا يتجاوزون أصابع اليدين وأنا واحد منهم. So the, there's a there's a period of remembering Allah سبحانه وتعالى in seclusion. It's part of the spiritual training of of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, spiritual aspirants in, in a spiritual path. Um, and so he said that Sheikh Al Hashimi. Um, he would enter people when they would ask him. But there is a number of people you can count on, the, on, the, on your hands, on the fingers of your hand, who he himself 
uh, said, I want you to enter uh, uh, this period of solitary remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sought them out. And uh, Sheikh uh, Mustafa said that I was one of them. النقاط عندي كثيرة لكن أختصر إلى هذا الحد وأقول جزا الله عنا كل من كان سببا لمعرفتنا في الشيخ مصطفى ابتداء من الشيخ نوح وانتهاء بالإمام زيد جزاهم الله عنا خيرا على هذا الكنز الذي كان يعني كنزا مخفيا فأظهره الحق بسببهم so, um, um... Sidi Munir has many more stories to tell, but um, he, um, he'll hand it over now to um, Imam Zaid, and he wants to, and he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward everybody who was a means or a reason for him to discover uh, and get to know Ima, uh, Sheikh Mustafa, who was a hidden treasure. Um, and so, and the, and the first means was Sheikh Nu, and he called him to arrange these classes and then, and then the last of the means was Imam Zaid Shakir, um, because of whom he um, got to know uh, Sheikh Mustafa. So, let's look at Imam Zaid Sidi. No. Imam Sidi. Now, 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 and he says that now we will leave the um, arena for Imam Zaid because um, when, when there's water, then uh, tayammum is invalid. And so Imam Zaid is like water with which we can make wudu. And Sidi Abu um, uh, is like, uh, he's saying that he's like the sand of tayammum. So uh, Allah 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 may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make a dua for Imam Zaid. So, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسلم كثيرا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وكرة عيوننا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, there are all indications my video is working, but perhaps if you can't see me as best, you won't you won't see me shedding any tears. Uh, it's, it's difficult to talk about Sheikh Mustafa. Uh, may Allah bless him. Uh, I'll start by saying uh, my, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us and myself to Sheikh Mustafa and vice versa. When I was intending to go to Damascus, there was a Syrian student. I was teaching political science at Southern Connecticut State University. And there was a, a student uh, in my class, Abdul Fatah Hammami, who was the son of Sheikh. Uh, Salim Hammami was a big scholar in Midan in, uh, in uh, Damascus. And Sheikh Abdul, uh, Abdul Fattah had made all of the arrangements. And uh, right before we were leaving, uh, I lost his phone number. And so I wrote him, but the response was delayed getting back to me. So we were at a uh, program in Abiquiu, New Mexico, the uh, former, the predecessor of the Dean Intensive Program that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf started. Uh, it was then called the Muslim Powwow. And so we were there and Sheikh Nuh came that particular year, this is 1994. And I told him of my predicament. And so he gave us Abu Munir's number. He said, well, when you get to Damascus, get in touch with Abu Munir. And so we came in the middle of the night or close to Fajr and we're in Zahra Qadima, which is the neighborhood Abu Munir lives in. And we're riding around the empty streets looking for Abu Munir. And so we finally found him and uh, the rest is, is history, as they say. Uh, Sheikh Mustafa, 
one of the things the people, the scholars uh, would say uh, about Sheikh Mustafa, Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. If you want to see a tabi, then go look at Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani. So if you want to see one of the successors to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, go look at Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani. And how, how did he resemble a tabi? And four uh, critical areas. And those areas are in terms of his knowledge. So the tabi'in took the knowledge from the companions and then they disseminated it to all of us. So the likes of Hassan al-Basri or Ata or many others. Uh, uh, Sayyid al-Musayyib, we should, certainly should mention in that regard. Uh, in terms of knowledge, in terms of character, in terms of service and subordinate to service, we will include his commitment to da'wah. So in, in terms of knowledge, we'll mention three areas, tasawwuf. And so as you heard from Sidi Abu Munir, and we forgot to say salam alaikum to Abu Munir and Ramadan Mubarak, and ask his forgiveness. And he, نعتذر على تقصيرنا في قيام بحقوقكم يا سيدي على كل حال So in, in terms of tasawwuf we mentioned as Sidi Abu Munir mentioned that Sheikh Mustafa was a, a leading student of Sheikh Muhammad al-Hashimi and so much at, at the young age of 27 years old he gave him uh, Sheikh Mustafa verbal permission to, to take on students himself and mentioned as Sidi Abu Munir mentioned that Sheikh Mustafa at that young age was a completed guide. And his guidance was as much with his uh, hal as it was with his maqal. So Sheikh Mustafa was one who guided mightily with the tongue of his state in addition to, to his speech. And as was mentioned in the introduction, he, he shied away from actively fulfilling the role that Sheikh al-Hashimi had given him permission to fulfill out of uh, humility. And uh, we'll come back to that issue, humility, inshallah. In terms of fiqh, as, as was also mentioned in the introduction, Sheikh Mustafa was a student of Sheikh Hassan Habanaka, the the Mufti of uh, of Syria, when when they de designated the position of uh, Mufti Mufti al the Mufti of the Syrian Republic, someone other than Sheikh Hassan was was appointed, and even that person had to acknowledge the virtue and the superiority and the qualifications of Sheikh Hassan Habanaka, that during his time there was no equal uh, to him in terms of his mastery of the divine law. So Sheikh uh, Hassan Habanaka started a, an institution, Mahad al tawjih And Sheikh Mustafa was part of a, a illustrious, an illustrious crop of alumni who graduated from Mahad al tawjih so their likes, uh, ranks would include Sheikh uh, Muhammad Sa'id Ramadan al Buti, Sheikh Mustafa Bugha, Sheikh Mustafa Khin, Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani, and, and many others of the luminaries of the ulama of Sham. And so when, when, when they would go on, those of them who went on to Al-Azhar to complete their studies, and this was the, the pre- uh, Jamal Abdul Nasir al-Azhar, when it was weakened by Nasir, uh, they would, in the four-year programs, the students who graduated from Mahad al Toji would go directly into the third year. And, and so it would, be, it would be like high school graduates going directly into the, the junior year at Harvard, skipping the first two years because they've already 
uh, covered and mastered all of that material in high school. And, and so Sheikh Mustafa was one of those students uh, who was mentored in the divine law by Sheikh Hassan Habenaka. Sheikh Mustafa had a third virtue in terms of knowledge and that was the Quran and the tafsir of the Quran. Uh, Sheikh Hassan would teach all of his students everything with the exception of Quran. Quran, we would send them to the Sheikh of the Quran, the reciters of Sham during his time who was Sheikh Hussein Khattab. So Sheikh Mustafa uh, studied Quran with Sheikh Hussein al Khattab and Sheikh Mustafa became a very uh, renowned Quran reciter. And one indication of his virtue is uh, many of the ulama were in Ramadan, we should say Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Uh, we're in the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan when, in, in which the Quran was revealed guidance for humanity, explication of that guidance and a criterion a moral and ethical criterion for determining right from wrong. Uh, she, uh, many of the ulama would gather for a gathering in the house of Sheikh Mekki al Katani, and they would have tarawi. So the ulama in the house of Sheikh Mekki, Mekki Katani would have tarawi, and Sheikh Mustafa, who was a young man at that time, was called on to lead the tarawi for all of these illustrious ulama of Sham in the house of Sheikh Mekki. So that just gives an indication of Sheikh Mustafa's uh, mastery of the Quran. And we'll return to his, his tafsir inshallah ta'ala. In terms of character, there's several things we can mention about Sheikh Mustafa that I witnessed firsthand. Uh, one, was Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I, I was the only one to do the five years and not, not complete as it ideally could have done for two things. Number one, as Abu Munir mentioned, we had to en go enroll in the Mahad. So I enrolled in Abi Nur, Mahad Abi Nur, and then Kulir to Da'wat al Islamiyah. And as Abu Munir said, you're studying psychology and uh, all sorts of other things in addition to uh, your, your Shari studies. Uh, so that took some time away from Sheikh Mustafa. Uh, also, the second issue that I was oh, leading a community in the States, I would go back in the summer. So that definitely set me back from fully benefiting. But Alhamdulillah, at, at the end of five years, I was the last man standing. Uh, some people uh, dropped out of the ten after one or two weeks because they 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 just couldn't adopt to not being your you're the top student in your college class and now you're going to learn your alphabet in Arabic properly and so it was too much for some people and then people moved on in different directions but I thank Allah that I was able to to stay in any case uh in those five years i never once heard sheikh mustafa speak ill of any human being or any creature not even a dog for that matter not once not one time not one time during those five years i never once even in the face of over the course of five years, distressing things happened, but there was never a time when there wasn't a pleasant uh, expression on Sheikh Mustafa's face. So implementing the, the prophetic hadith, uh, don't be don't be mean even the slightest amount of good, even if it's meeting your brother with a pleasant face. Sheikh Mustafa met everyone with a pleasant face. 
So there are a few pictures of the Sheikh uh, out there. Very few, but you, you'll never see a picture of Sheikh Mustafa without a pleasant face. And in five years, I never saw Sheikh Mustafa without uh, a, a, a pleasant face. The, the second quality in terms of character is uh, patience. So as Abu Munir said, Sheikh Mustafa committed to, to teach us for five years uh, under the circumstances possible in, in Syria at the time. And as I said, some, some, one day one of the uh, people who was with our delegation, he mentioned to Sheikh Mustafa that, you know, uh, something, I, I forget the exact wording, but the essence of what he said was, uh, how can you have patience for five years? And, and Sheikh Mustafa responded, he said, you'll see, I have more patience with you than you have with me. And, and the, that person who asked that uh, question was one of the first ones to drop off. And so Sheikh Mustafa, he, he was there to the very, very end. And it, it shows his patience because he, he was a, a, one of the a great scholars of Damascus during this time. And he can... They say in Arabic, min kibari ulama. So he wasn't just a common scholar. He was, as we said, he, he went through the same uh, process as Dr. Bouti. He went through the same process as Sheikh Abdurrahman in terms of tasawwuf and, and, uh, and tafsir and fiqh. He was a master. And he's teaching us the basics uh, of the religion, the basics of Arabic. And as time went on, uh, more advanced subjects, but uh, the, it took a lot of patience. And he never once indicated any displeasure. He never once indicated any lack of, of, of any frustration. Not one time and during, during that period of time. Uh, uh, his, his honesty in terms of character, as Abu Mumira mentioned, he was, he was true to what he pledged. He said he'd give five years day and night. And he, he absolutely meant that. He, he was only limited by our limitations. So we had to go to the Mahat. We had to uh, do different things. Some of us were married. We had to take kids to school. We had to do uh, different things. We had to go shop for our wives. So uh, our limitations were what? Uh, prevented him from just totally. And so he, he was truthful in, in what he pledged. He made himself available. I, I can remember many times going uh, to his house at various hours. And one of the things when, whenever we went, if he wasn't sleeping, rahimahullah, he was either reading the Quran, reciting the Quran, or he was review, reviewing some aspect of, of knowledge, rahimahullah, ta'ala. But frequently, is reviewing Qur'an, reviewing Qur'an, reviewing Qur'an. May Allah have mercy on him. And, and he availed himself. Of whatever we needed or asked for, he was there. We had a question, he was there. Uh, and in terms of his character, as we said, if you want to see uh, a tabi, go see Sheikh Mustafa which uh, rahimahullah, which indicates his commitment to the Quran and Sunnah. So he was, he was a shadily and influenced also for, by the Rifa'iya and, and uh, Suluk and Tasawwuf. Uh, he was a faqih, he was, he was all of that. Uh, but he was, he was genuinely concerned about the, the well-being uh, of others, so he was he was true to what he said, and then uh, the final thing we'll mention in, in terms of his his character was his humility. Uh, Sheikh Mustafa was the the epitome of humility, and this was an influence of his his father-in-law. His father-in-law was a great great Sheikh uh, Muhakkik uh, in the Rifai. Uh, Tariqa and the Rifa'iyah 
and not the rifa'iya you might see on uh, on National Geographic channel putting uh, sheiks through their cheeks and things like that, but the the true rifa'iya, very knowledge based tariqa descendant from the eponym of that tariqa, Sheikh Ahmed al Rifai. But his medkhal, Sheikh Abdul the Shadali, is the tariqa to shukr. And the rifa'iya tariqa to tawada. It's a, it's a path of humility. And Sheikh Mustafa was, was so humble. Even the fact he humbled himself to teach us, like beginners, he didn't. Well, you know, are any of them know Arabic thoroughly already? Any of them, uh, you, you know, uh, advanced students? Yeah, so uh, I was talking about Sheikh Mustafa's humility, how he humbled himself to teach us, even though we were beginning students. He, he humbled himself in walking to our uh, apartment as a, and, and thereby exposing himself to risk because just as he mentioned the Abu Munir, and then out of humility, I don't want to expose them to, to any risk. And that's another indication of his character, but he exposed himself to risk because I, I think I was preparing to say, they, they say in Damascus, yani, adhan, that even the walls have ears. And so the same uh, forces that would have been spying on us going to his house, they were spying on him coming to our house. And that would arouse equal, if not more, suspicion. Uh, but he gave priority to our safety and security. May Allah have uh, mercy on him. And uh, the, the final thing I'll say about his character, Rahimahullah, is his, uh, his contentment with Allah Ta'ala's decree. So one of the things that Sheikh Mustafa would frequently say is just a rida, a rida ya sidi, a rida bil qada, this being pleased with, with the decree. And so Sheikh Mustafa was a person whose every fiber of his being radiated complete contentment with the decree of Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so fittingly, when, when they, the brothers got together and they built Sheikh Mustafa a masjid, they called the Masjid Jami Rida. So the, 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 the masjid of pleasure. And so uh, he was, that was, mashallah. And then the fourth thing, I mentioned four things, is his service to the ummah. And expressed in two ways. One was direct service. So one of the things Sheikh Mustafa availed himself for us, and I should say for me, because at this point, uh, everyone's gone. I'm, I'm the only one left. But after Fajr, we have our classes, so four days a week. When I moved away from the neighborhood, I, I would ride a, this, the bl big black heavy duty Chinese bike. Uh, across town from either Muhajirin or from who knows where to uh, Zahra Qadima. I start as soon as they made the Adhan, I would start. So between the Adhan Iqama and the Iqama of Fajr is half an hour in Damascus. So I would ri arrive just in time to pray Tahitul Masjid and then join the congregation. Yeah, which, which re reminds me, I meant to mention this about Sheikh Mustafa's uh, uh, humility that he gave the lessons. So I, we, we met in our house and then things got a little relaxed and we started actually meeting in this house of Sheikh Mustafa. And then the, the Muqabarat started, you know, sending signals. So we were meeting in the masjid, total transparency. Anyone could drop in, sit in the halakha, so we met in the masjid, but the masjid, the imam was Sheikh Muhammad Farah. And uh, Sheikh Mustafa would not sit in the seat that Sheikh Muhammad would sit in to teach. He would not ascend the mimbar, he would sit on the floor. He would say, Makani Huna, this is my place on the floor. 
and and even though as i said he's he was i i don't, I, I don't want to compare any of the scholars but i think most people will consider and knowledge that sheikh mustafa was of a higher rank than sheikh muhammad farah but despite that sheikh mustafa would not sit in the place of sheikh muhammad he will not assume any uh give any pretenses that he considered himself his superior in any way shape or form whatsoever and then his humility is also displayed in his his reluctance and refusal to to teach in the majalis even after sheikh abdurrahman was ill and so it was only when sheikh abdurrahman couldn't even in many instances attend they would bring Sheikh Abdurrahman Rahimullah. And only when he couldn't physically be present did Sheikh Mustafa began to teach. And as Abu Munir said, it was with great uh, uh, difficulty that they were able to induce Sheikh, Sheikh Mustafa uh, Rahimullah to, to teach. And then, so I mentioned the fourth area is service. And so that service, we would go, so we'd have our class, and then after Fajr, we'd go to this house for tahniq of, of the baby. So to rub some uh, date and saliva on the palate of, of the newborn child, or to go to this house to visit the sick, or go to this house occasionally for breakfast. And, and so Sheikh Mustafa was always serving the people in that way. Another way was, his classes in the evening. In the evening, he would teach tafsir at different masajids. So he had a tafsir class in one of the masjids in Midan. I don't know if it was Jamil Manjaq, which was the, the masjid of Sheikh Salim Hammami. But I know he had one day in, in our local masjid, was Jamil Ashmar, which was named after Sheikh Muhammad Al Ashmar one of the great heroes of the, the Palestinian struggle who, who will go from Sham to Palestine and end in the struggle against the French occupation, but a, a great scholar. And Sheikh uh, Muhammad al-Ashmar was known also for his humility and his timidity. That he was a very timid, shy man and, and, and very small stature, but they said when he was fighting in Philistine or, or against the French, he was like a lion. He would just, just totally transform. So uh, and another, so his tafsir classes, Sheikh Mustafa would give one in Mukhayyim, Palestine. I'm sure Abu Munir uh, remembers right near the Dawar. So there was a big traffic circle and behind the traffic circle was the Palestinian refugee camp, Mukhayyim, Palestine. And right at the entrance of the camp, there was a masjid and Sheikh Mustafa would walk there and uh, give the tafsir class. So I was blessed to attend probably most of those classes in Jamil Ashmar and in Jamil, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Rahma in the uh, Mukhayyum Palestine. So, and so those are some of the ways that Sheikh Mustafa served in addition. And, and so, and that was one aspect of his service. Another aspect is Dawah. And so as Abu Munir mentioned, he said when he was first approached, about our coming that since I can't go to America to make dawah, I'll, I'll train these 10 people and I'll send back 10 copies of myself to call the people to, to Islam. And so his, his scholarship and his tasawwuf, so we, we always talk about how the Sufis brought Islam to Indonesia and the Sufis brought Islam to Central Asia and the Sufis brought Islam to many parts of Africa and the Sufis brought Islam here and there. But sometimes the people of Tasawwuf contemporarily act like Dawa is anathema. And uh, uh, the people of Tasawwuf have nothing to do with Dawa. 
And so this, as you heard Abu Munir say, and as I will, will reiterate, this was a key concern of Sheikh Mustafa. And this, it was visible in his, 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 his khutbahs once the masjid was established. It was evident in his teachings uh, in the various masajids, relevant in his going around to, to meet and interact with the people, rahimahullah. And as you know, I was reading, I just happened to, to on my shelf this morning, uh, one of the few things that uh, we can find in writing from Sheikh Mustafa, rahimahullah. Uh, he wrote, wrote one of the introductory uh, recommendations of uh, CD Dr. Jibril, uh, Jibril Fuad Haddad's uh, uh, selection and translation of 40 hadith on the virtues of sham. And, and the first uh, commendation for the book is written by Sheikh Mustafa Turkmani. And the entire thing is just about hijra. It's about hijra. And as many of you know, the, the ulama of Syria generally are very pro-hijra. They're, they're generally against Muslims staying in the, the non-Muslim lands. So and the view of many of them converts should come back or should migrate to Darul Islam. Uh, you'll find that, for example, in Sheikh Mustafa Buga in his commentary on uh, the hadith of Riyadh al-Salihim. Uh, so the first hadith, uh, when, when he talks about it, he, he talks about how, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, in Nuzat al-Muttaqin, Shar Riyadh al-Salihim. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right. But. I got the right book now. So in, in his commentary, you, you'll see how he mentions the importance and the incumbency of hijrah. And this is the general orientation. And that, that introduction of, of Sheikh Mustafa to CD uh, Sheikh Jibril Haddad's book on the virtue of Shem, it was all about hijrah. But us, he always oriented us to go back. You have to go back. And one of the things he will point to, and Abu Munir ha has seen this, some of you probably have, I shared it with some people, was the, there's a, a, a page or so in a book by Sheikh Ahmed Rawas, who was a great Rifai Sheikh. And the book is called Raf Raf Al Inaya. Raf Raf Al Inaya. And in there he says that at the end of time, when the Western nations are at the peak of their power and they're at the height of their enmity towards Islam, Allah Ta'ala is going to blow the Muhammadiyah breezes over those lands and they're going to touch the hearts and you're going to see people entering into Islam in the Western land in crowds and you're going to see a person who one day he's the most bitter enemy of Islam and the next day it's as if he's a wali. And he said, this is all a gift to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so this Sheikh Mustafa showed us that and he said, you have to go back and make da'wah. There's going to be a great opening in, in uh, Islam, fil Ghab, Wallahu yuhayyi rijal and Allah is preparing the people who are going to make that possible. And so this just shows the concern that Sheikh Mustafa, rahimahullah, the concern that he had in terms of da'wah. And so in all of those areas, he was like a tabi'i. And I, I, I just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed to have had the opportunity to just spend that much time and, and that degree of intimacy in so many different settings. One of the things when we first got to Damascus, this is from the Khidma of Abu Mudir. Uh, Abu Mudir Khadim al Shiyukh. He's the Khadim of, of, the, of the Sheikhs. He's, as was meant, he's the Khadim of, of Sheikh uh, Abdurrahman. And when, when, we, when I went to visit Abu Munir two summers ago and to visit Sheikh Nu and, and the, the height and corruption, I, I was blessed to, to have spent a little bit of time with Sheikh Hamza also. He was working on a project there and we got to visit him. Uh, 
I wanted to go to uh, to one of the Syrian refugee camps. So we were going to Muqayyam um, al-Zaatari, uh, so the, the Zaatari camp. And so we got to the entrance of the camp and we couldn't get in. We never got clearance from the interior ministry. So just some foreign guy comes and he's gonna go into the camp, right? So we never, uh, I, di I didn't have the foresight to uh, seek clearance from the interior ministry. So we, we, so we were there and we're, we're not arguing with the guys because we, we were wrong, they were right. And then suddenly someone says, Salaamu Alaikum. And, and not too far off in the distance towards the entrance of the camp, there was a, 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 a brother and this brother was the brother that had directed Sidi Abu Munir to Sheikh Abdul Rahman. And so I said, this is why we came here. We didn't come here to visit the camp. We came here to meet this brother. And so Allah has, has his, his, his plans. But so Sidi Abu Munir was able to serve Sheikh Abdul Rahman and the successor uh, and Khalifa of Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Sheikh Mustafa, and the successor, successor and Khalifa of Sheikh Mustafa, Sheikh uh, Shukr Luhafi, Rahimahumullahu Jami'an. May Allah have mercy on all of them. And, and through Abu Munir, I was blessed to, to meet Sheikh Abdul Rahman, to take the tariqah from Sheikh Abdul Rahman, to run to the Khalwa with Sheikh Abdul Rahman. Uh, and and to before he got sick, Sheikh Abdurrahman had these beautiful Friday morning uh, jalsas, a gathering in his house, where after Fajr people would come from different parts of the city, but not not too many people, maybe 20, 25 people. And Sheikh Ab Abdurrahman had a dars and did show his concern with dawah also, and also his range. So Sheikh Abdurrahman and his dars. He was teaching uh, Al Futuhat al Makkiyah uh, by Sheikh Al Akbar. He was teaching the uh, Umm al Barahin. And he was teaching Hayat al Sahaba and Dawah. Uh, and so that, that's, that's the focus right there Hayat al Sahaba, Umm al Barahin, and uh, Al Futuhat al Makkiyah and probably one of the last people to teach the Futuhat because we personally, I respect Imam Suyuti's uh, fatwa concerning it. Sheikh Al-Akbar was a great scholar. His greatness was affirmed by his contemporaries, uh, but you shouldn't read his books without a qualified guide. And Sheikh Abdurrahman was one of the last qualified guides. I'm sure there are others, but who might still be alive. And I was able to uh, uh, shake uh, the guidance and, and assistance of Sheikh Abdurrahman to visit Sheikh Shukri in his humble house. Sheikh Shukri lived in a basement. I think it was just the living room, bedroom, kitchen, a uh, basement apartment uh, in Damascus. And uh, mashallah, he, he received people with so much humility uh, Sheikh Shukri would ride a bicycle, one of the big black Chinese bikes that I rode to, to the Durst. He would ride that to the Majalis. And it was frequently he would have a couple children either on the back or sitting on the crossbar. And he's pedaling with the kids and giving them a lift uh, to, to the Majalis. And Sheikh Shukri would organize the shoes of the people he would give water to the people. And even when he became the Khalifa of Sheikh Mustafa, and he was now going to comment on whatever was being read in the Dars, Sheikh Shukri insisted he would only do it if they allowed him to continue to serve water to the people. So these are the people we were blessed to meet and to spend time with. And we thank Allah profusely for those opportunities. Those are opportunities that they, they don't, they're rare, especially in this modern uh, situation we find ourselves in. And so we, we thank Allah, we thank Abu Munir, we thank Sheikh Hamza for affording this opportunity to, to talk a little about Sheikh Mustafa. I'll conclude with another saying.
that Sheikh Mustafa. So the two things that really stuck with me and stick with me from my time with Sheikh Mustafa is, is uh, number one, as I mentioned, al Rida, al Rida Yasidi, al Rida. Just be content, be content, be content. So be content, people, all this coronavirus stuff, just be content with Allah. And the second one, he would say frequently, and this goes back to Dawah. Rajulun Wahidun, Sahibul Han, you effir ala elfi Rajul. That a single person who has a refined spiritual state can affect a thousand people. And a thousand people collectively with no refinement in their state collectively cannot affect a single person. And so Sheikh Mustafa would frequently say that. So I'll leave you with that. May Allah give you all tawfiq taysir. I'll, I'll, re- I'll, I'll pre-record, inshallah, what, what I intended to say. And I'll share that with Sheikh Hamza. And if he chooses to make that available to everyone who, who signed up, and uh, I'll leave that to him. Barakallahu feekum. La tukabban minkum. Fa naqra al-fatiha. Li sidna al-Sheikh Mustafa. Fa nasallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala. An yuwasi'a lahu fi qabrihi. Wa an yu'attira qabrahu. وَأَنْ يَفْتَحَ فِي قَبْرِهِ نَافِذَةً وَهُوَ يَرَوْ خِلَالَهَا مَكَانَهُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَأَنْ نَسَلَ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانُهُ وَتَعَالَى أَنْ يَجْعَلَ قَبْرَ الشَّيْخِ مُسْتَفَى وَكُبُورَ جَمِيعَ الشُّيُوقِ رَوْدَةً مِنْ رِيَاضِ الْجَنَّةِ الْفَاتِحَةِ And uh, I just like to add that, that, that um, we're all grateful um, that um, you and Sidi Abu Munir um, had, a, um, had the chance to spend time with all of these people because through you, um, we, uh, we benefit from them. And, um, and just hearing you recount um, your experiences with uh, uh, Sheikh Mustafa, you know, I, was, I was very, I, you know, I, I don't think you remember me, but I was there for a summer, and I met you and while you were studying, and, and Abu Munir as well. And um, and there was an there was a outing that uh, that uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman and Sheikh Mustafa took all of the Western students of knowledge to to this villa, and there was a swimming pool, and and um, um, that and, was you. <laughs> and Abu Munir was there serving, and uh, and you know I was like, I wanted to I heard so much about him. But um, but especially w- w- when you when you describe the way that he was, um, without without having spent you know the time that you have spent with him, you know it's something that it awakens something. And so I jazakumullah khairan. There was there's one question maybe I was hoping you could you could ask. It came in before the session, and somebody's asking regarding you. You said that Sheikh Mustafa. You mentioned Sheikh Mustafa. He wanted you and others to go back to the West to spread Islam. So um, how would he have um, reacted? So when we, if, if, there is, if there is a Muslim who is, um, uh, you know, the question is saying if they're absorbed by the Western culture that they're a part of. Um, so how, uh, so the, so the questioner is asking that, there's, that, they, that she finds a dichotomy, that how can we be soft to them while, uh, while not wanting our silence to be understood as consent? So how would Sheikh Mustafa have, um, have uh, have interacted in such situations and called such people to to Islam. Let, let, let me re- recant. So, are are you referring to Muslims or people? Yes, who the are question Muslims? is about Muslims. Okay, and it's so Muslims who are might ab- be a little absorbed in the Western lifestyle. How do you gently? So, uh, so the question. I'll read the question. It says. How do we deal with Muslims who are absorbed by the Western culture they're a part of? On one hand, we want to be soft in our dealings with them. On the other hand, we don't want our silence to be misunderstood as consent. And this is regarding Sheikh Mustafa's view on going back to the West to spread Islam. Yeah. 
I, I think that in, in that case, uh, Sheikh Mustafa would have led by example, right? So I, I think I mentioned uh, he guided more with the tongue of his state than the tongue of his speech. And so I think in that situation where speech might have been uh, counterproductive, I think the Sheikh would have found a way to convey uh, displeasure or to pr com uh, put, uh, convey the proper course of action in those various situations that the person might be absorbed in without even speaking. And I think that's very important. I could, along those lines, relate something that occurred with Sheikh Abdurrahman. Uh, there, there was a, a young uh, brother from one of the English-speaking countries, I don't know if it was the US, Canada, or Britain, who, who came to Damascus while I was there, and he wanted to go visit Sheikh Abdurrahman. So we went, took him to see uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman, and so one of us translated for him, and he said to Sheikh Abdurrahman, no, 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 that's another story. In the interest of time, I'll bypass that story, even though I probably whetted your appetite. Someone was leaving. So he, he had been there for a while, so he could speak for himself in Arabic. So he said to Sheikh Abdurrahman, he says, Sidi, I'm going back to my country, and in our town, there's only, there's one masjid. In that masjid, there's everybody, there's Ikhwan, Hizbat Tahrir, Naqshibandiya, uh, Qadiriya, Chishtiya, uh, there's, there's uh, Salafiya, like everyone's there. He said, how can I go back and call to the Tariqa without adding to the confusion? And Sheikh Abdurrahman said to him, you call to, 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 in that situation, you call to the Tariqa with the tongue of your state and not with the tongue of your speech. In other words, that people see the superiority of your way in you, and you won't have to open your mouth and thereby add to the confusion of these various uh, uh, orientations. And so I think that Sheikh Mustafa along those lines would have demonstrated to a person who's drowned and absorbed in the West uh, the proper course of action, refraining from certain things uh, through his action and example and not necessarily through any speech whatsoever, be it gentle speech or be it uh, vulgar and coarse speech. There was another question, uh, Sheikh Hamza, that was afforded to me. I think it's an important question, so could I deal with that question? please. Yeah, that question was, uh, someone asked, is there a place for tariqa here in the West? And you know, there, there's a place for tariqa everywhere, but we have to be wise and we have to try, the people of tariqa have to be wise and we have to try to avoid uh, the mistakes that alienate people from tasawwuf. And so we, we have to root our affair in, in sharia, uh, number one, in the divine law. And that's what all of us were taught, as Sheikh Hamza knows well and others, and uh, we, we have to, it's very important for those who assume the role of teachers of Tasawwuf in any level or capacity to undermine anything that would convey uh, the air of cultishness. And so that's something else that alienates a lot of people. Even a lot of Murids sometimes just get frustrated because they feel like they're in a cult. And, and not in a, a brotherhood and sisterhood of healthy Muslims. And it's the responsibility of those in leadership to short circuit and undermine uh, the, the, those, the things that give that pretense, especially in public settings. And because otherwise people are like, oh yeah, that's, that's just what I heard about these Sufis. And they'll misunderstand things, they'll, they'll interpret things based on their whims and their imagination. And, and so it's not that the quote unquote Sufi has done anything wrong, 
just he or she has not been cautious and careful not to engage in practices or not to engage in, 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 in behaviors that would give the impression to an outsider that some sort of cult is being formed around an individual. So they're, 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 with, with those two uh, caveats, I think there's definitely a role, especially now you see like, Muslims are depressed like everyone else because of this coronavirus situation and, and not able to see the opportunities in what is a challenging, challenging situation. But uh, I, I mentioned last night in another uh, venue the, the saying of the Atayla, some people are getting stir crazy and anxiety from being in isolation. I said, Ibn Atayla reminds us, Nothing benefits the heart like isolation, that uh, it enters thereby into the realms of, comp of contemplation. And so we, we have to really, uh, uh, this is a great opportunity for tasawwuf, but we have to present the teachings with wisdom and, uh, and, and focus on the needs of the people right now. And so the needs of the people right now, they might be different from the needs of the people I was with when I was in Damascus. It's a different time and a different place. And so trying to be true to what we were taught on the one hand is extremely important, but trying to understand our situation, I think is also extremely important. And if we can strike that balance, I think Tosowa will, will, will not only find a place in the West, it will strive, it will thrive. And there's been great growth as, as you've all seen. Like 20 years ago, if you said uh, to so if people would chase you out of the masjid and now it's accepted and you find even the equani organizations having programs in Teskir to Nufus and uh, all of these things and dusting off some of uh, Said Hawa's book, and things like that. So that that's uh, owing, owing to the gradual acceptance of Tasawwuf. And I think that if, if we're wise and sincere, and sincerity is extremely important, we, we can, we can, it can become just mainstream. No one, everyone understands this is an essential and critical part of our religion. So yeah, I just wanted to say that to that particular question, Sidi. Uh, thank you for um, honoring us, Sidi. Uh, Abdul Rahman Ashraf, he's launching um, a book that was uh, written by Abu Munir on health. Um, so I'll just let him say a couple of words um, and then inshallah we'll, uh, we'll conclude inshallah. Fadlul Sidi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So, jazakum khair to Imam Zaid and um, Abu Munir And uh, of course, Sheikh Hamza for today's Mubarak uh, gathering You know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, benefit us By mentioning the awliya and by our love for the awliya So one of the themes of uh, this lecture or this series of lectures that uh, Sira Hamza had uh, has been having is coping with COVID, you know, turning to turning the crisis into an opportunity with Abu Munir. So alhamdulillah, you know, in that, um, in that vein, you know, we are very uh, pleased and, and it's our honor and pleasure to announce the official release of the long awaited uh, translation of Abu Munir's uh, book called Food Between Curse and Cure. As, as we all know, uh, Abu Munir was a personal khadim of Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Sheikh Huri, and uh, Sheikh Mustafa, and Sheikh Shukri, and, and many of the other awliya and ulama and Muslims in, in uh, Syria and Jordan uh, his entire life, and he continues to do so. If you wanted to summarize Abu Munir's um, life in one word, it would be sincere khidma or sincere service 
And so um, all of most of 2019, you know, we had the blessing to um, have a lot, uh, you know, be in the company of Abu Munir. And we used to have a lot of majalis and under the guidance of functional medical doctors, integrative doctors and traditional physicians, Abu Munir, he compiled uh, the present book um, as a guide to an optimal diet and lifestyle to help the Muslim uh, ummah attain unto the goodly life or in Arabic is, as the, the Quran mentions the hayat tayyibah. So um, the Arab world, um, you know, obviously Abu Munir wrote it in Arabic and uh, the Arab world at that time immediately benefit, you know, people with chronic conditions were completely cured of this or that, uh, you know, uh, condition. And, um, you know, Sina Sheikh Nuh, he had requested this book to be translated. And so, alhamdulillah, at his request, we translated the book into English. And it is now, um, and we also added uh, and expanded upon it for the Western audience, uh, you know, backed by research and reviewed by experts in the field. And so, alhamdulillah, we announced, um, you know, by the uh, favor and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, food between curse and cure. So um, if we can kindly request Imam Zaid, um, just maybe a, you know, a minute or two, the importance of health and Islam and how um, in general, uh, but also specifically now with the COVID pandemic um, in mind, it, it just emphasizes how we all need, you know, need to be at a certain level of, of optimal health. Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, Marhim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Wa Salatu Wa Salam, Alayhi Sayyidil Mursaleen. If Abu Munir wrote it or compiled it, I endorse it before I even see it uh, because I have complete confidence in, in his integrity. And also, uh, I know uh, that Alhamdulillah, he, he, he is in a home were between himself and Umm Munir, they, they eat very well and very healthily. And he's been in the company of those who also took great uh, care in terms of their diet. Sheikh Mustafa was that way, Sheikh Abdurrahman was that way, uh, and I'm sure Sheikh Shukri wa was that way in terms of not overeating, in terms of eating of the good and pure things that, were encouraged, that are encouraged by our law. And in terms of uh, really focusing on those uh, particular uh, foods that the Prophet has uh, encouraged and en endorsed. So I was just, in fact, uh, I had an opportunity to speak. The, the nation of Islam, alhamdulillah, they're fasting Ramadan now. So they're slowly, they're, they're coming. Make dua for them. Don't, don't curse them. Make dua that they continue their praying their salah uh, as opposed to sitting in chairs and making what we would call dua. They're facing the Qibla of Mecca and making salah. They're fasting Ramadan. So they have a, a Ramadan uh, prayer line, they call it. So after Fajr, every morning, about 1,500 of their members from various parts of the country, even the Caribbean and elsewhere, they're on a line. So... The last few years, I've, I've been able to speak to them. And I actually spoke about, there were three uh, literary pieces when I was a, a young person, way back in the day, uh, that the Nation of Islam were known for. One was the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. The second was Elijah Muhammad's book, Message to the Black Man. And the third was a book called How to Eat to Live. And I just mentioned how, uh, as, as those of us here in the United States know, the overwhelming uh, number of those suffering from COVID-19 or the largest and community suffering the most dis disproportionately is the African-American community. And that's largely due to pre-existing conditions, those primarily being uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity and how there are environmental uh, structural factors that, that aid that. But my point was we, could, we can wait for the system to reform itself. So we can wait for 
the likes of our president and others to become enlightened human beings and dedicate uh, themselves fully to eradicating those structural conditions such as building highways through the heart of African American communities like uh, 580, Highway 580 in Oakland, California, or, or I-75 through Paradise Valley, uh, one of the most uh, prosperous uh, black communities in the United States, and, and many other planned uh, communal destruction, destructive actions that contribute to the asthma. Uh, the port in West Oakland, uh, and all the diesel trucks and diesel ships coming in and out. And, and, and so we can wait for the government to become enlightened and start uh, eradicating those structural issues, or we can begin taking our own initiative. M Muslims, we take our own initiative. And so they have this book, How to Eat to Live, how to address the uh, issues of diabetes and the issues of obesity, which then those two are closely related, and the, the issue of hypertension through diet. And, and so we as Muslims have an opportunity to put a book like this book, I encourage everyone to support it, uh, out there, not just amongst the Muslims, but amongst in the African American community and other communities where a lot of these so-called pre-existing conditions make those communities more vulnerable to having a negative uh, outcome if they are afflicted by the virus. So we thank Sidi Abu Munir and we thank Sidi Abdurrahman Ashraf and everyone else who, who's worked on this project for making it available to the Muslims. And maybe this will come our, this will become our Sunni Muslim How to Eat to Live. And it will have wide acceptance uh, amongst the Muslims and also amongst the, the wider public here and become a source of much, 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 much good uh, for those who read it and good for the souls of uh, those uh, who worked on it, such as Sidi uh, Abu Munir and Sidi Abdurrahman and others. Let me say this in conclusion. I already went over my time. But since I'm over the time, I might as well really go over the time. Just as there are physical pre-existing conditions that make us more vulnerable to negative uh, outcomes when we, if we are challenged by the virus, there are also spiritual pre-existing conditions that make us more vulnerable to mental and psychological and spiritual uh, negative outcomes if we're in, because of the situation we're in. And, and so disbelief, weak faith, lack of faith, lack of dhikr, lack of Qur'an, all of those things are spiritual preconditions that aid a person being afflicted with anxiety to an unmanageable, unmanageable degree, to being afflicted with depression to an unmanageable degree, to being afflicted with those sorts of illnesses, uh, despairing of Allah Ta'ala's mercy, questioning the wisdom of Allah Ta'ala. So just as we work to address, and I'm not, not saying uh, if you are afflicted with those mentors, definitely consult a, a, a professional, a therapist, but also try to eliminate the pre-existing pre -existing condition that makes it unmanageable for you. So turn to the Quran, maintain your awrad, maintain your afkar, maintain your connection uh, to, to, to the book of Allah and maintain a good opinion of Allah and that will address those spiritual and mental and psychological pre-existing conditions that are overwhelming people and even leading to record amounts of suicide. So may Allah give us tawfiq to her, to Tawfiq, Taysir, Kabul. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum al khair, Imam Zaid. Um, is uh, Sheikh Hamza, is Abu Munir still available? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Sayyid al-awwalina wa al-akhirin wa habibi rabbil alameen. 
أقول سيد عبد الرحمن أنك وضعت على الطبخ بهار كثير وضعت على الطبخة بهارات كثيرة Um, uh, so Sidi Bumunir uh, says that you have placed uh, many spices on the table. أنت تقول خادم الشيخ عبد الرحمن خادم الشيخ مصطفى خادم الشيخ شكري خادم خد نحن في الحقيقة كانوا هم لنا يعني الذين يخدمون إخوانهم الشيوخ نحن فقط لنا النسبة نسبت إلينا هذه الخدمة ونحن حقيقة ما قدمنا شيء يعني من الخدمة لكن عاد نسأل الله أن يجزيهم عنا خير الجزاء ولا نضع بهارات كثير تاني مرة للطبخ um, He says that, uh, that uh, people are saying that Sidi Munir is the Khadim of, uh, of Sheikh Mustafa and the Khadim of Sheikh Abdul Rahman and the Khadim of Sheikh Shukri and, um, and he is the one who has um, His, uh, he said that he doesn't deserve um, these um, these praises, and uh, he hasn't done anything. And next time, don't put all of these spices, extra spices, in the food to make it better than it is. Allah يجعلنا وإياكم من المقبولين وأن ينفعنا برؤية من رأينا وصحبة من يسر الله لنا صحبتهم. نسأل الله أن يكون ذلك حجة لنا لا علينا. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and give you tawfiq and, and benefit you through the, uh, through the people who uh, Sidi Abu Munir has seen and kept the company of. And may he make uh, that benefit a, uh, a proof that is uh, written in his favor on the Day of Judgment and not written against him. This book is not أقيد هذه النصائح التي كانوا إخواننا يعني ينصحون بها فالفقير فقط قيدتها وهم عندما رأوها قالوا هذا جيد لو نبدأ بنشره يعني فانتشر هنا في في عمان وفي غيرها ووجدنا به يعني كثيرا من من طبقه أنه استغنى عن بعض الأدوية Sayyid uh, Mubunir says that he only, his, uh, his role was only to record what, uh, uh, what the other uh, people around him in the neighborhood had advised him and what he'd learned from them. Um, so he, re- he merely recorded, it's not from him. And then after he recorded it, he was asked um, if it can be printed and distributed so that other people can benefit from it. And so he consented and people, uh, and he saw that people, they benefited from it. And people had chronic diseases like diabetes and other diseases. And when they um, followed what was recorded in the book, uh, they um, recovered. وهذه الأجسام والأجساد عندنا أمانة من الله سبحانه وتعالى. فيجب علينا إذا سمعنا نصيحة ما أن نطبقها حتى نحافظ على هذا الجسد يعني ما استطعنا إلى ذلك من سبيل This body that we have is a trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us So if we hear somebody um, giving us sincere advice on how to care for it then it's obligatory on us to, uh, to act in accordance with that advice in order to fulfill this trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted us with. Wisdom is the lost camel of the believer. A famous saying that's found in our tradition, um, wherever he finds it, he takes ownership of it. Uh, meaning that if you, we find something good that comes from a non-Islamic source, then the believer has greater right to benefit from it than anyone else. وقد جربت هذه النصائح وكان يعني لها أثر إيجابي عند الكثير من من طبقها. These, uh, the advice that's mentioned in this book has been tested and it had a uh, positive effect on many people who applied it. 
فنسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يلهمنا الصواب في القول والعمل وقالوا أن المؤمن يعرف ماذا يدخل إلى جوفه وماذا يخ... ماذا يدخل إلى فيه وماذا يخرج من فيه فما يدخل إلى في... من فيه الطعام والشراب وما يخرج من فيه ال... الكلام الطيب says that um, they say that the believer uh, knows what comes out. So it's a, a, a pun uh, in Arabic. The believer knows what comes out of his, uh, what goes into his mouth uh, and what comes out of his mouth. What goes into his mouth of the food and what comes out of his mouth of uh, good speech. And so he should guard it, in other words. And be careful of what, what he puts in and what he sends out. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. And uh, these are means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed. Um, that if we take, he uh, regularly associates these means with benefit, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who benefits and harms. Rahimallah, Shaykh Abdul Rahman, Yaqul, As-sabab wajib, wa nafyu al-ta'thir anhu wajib. Shaykh Abdul Rahman, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, used to say that it's obligatory to take the means and it's also obligatory to believe that the means don't have any effect and that all power lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. وَكَانَ يَقُولْ مَنْ تَرَكَ الْأَسْبَابِ فَقَدْ عَطَّلَ الْحِكْمَةِ وَمَنْ أَثْبَتَ لَهَا التَّأْثِيرِ فَقَدْ أَشْرَكَ بِاللَّهِ He used to say that whoever um, abandons taking the means has, um, has contravened the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has gone against the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in the universe the way that things, that Allah has decreed things should run. And whoever, um, whoever ascribes any kind of um, effect to them, any kind of independent effect to them, has, has associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ta'am wa sharab wa naw'iyyatuhu hadha sababun min al-isbab. So um, food and drink and the kind of food and drink that we consume is a means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed um, for our benefit. It said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, O oh my servant, um, obey me, obey my commands, and um, don't tell me what is, uh, what is better for you. Uh, meaning that we take the means and we do what, because we're commanded to take the means uh, in order to fulfill our slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we leave everything else to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we leave it to Allah to create whatever he wills. So he says that when we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by eating and drinking in a way that, uh, that uh, preserves this trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, the body, the means by which we worship him, then we have fulfilled his command. And, uh, and then we leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring about the the benefit as a result of it. في بعض هذه نصائح هذا الكتاب في شيء مهم كان جدا وله أثر نبوي وهو ترك الطحين وهذا أو بدعة كانت في الطعام والشراب بعد رسول الله صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم هي نخل الطحين يعني إخراج القشرة من القمح some of the things that are mentioned in the book have a basis um, in the practice of the early Muslims. And one of these is avoiding um, flour. 
So the early Muslims, they used to say that the first innovation that was introduced, one of the first innovations that was, in, that was introduced was um, white flour, removing the, the bran and uh, other um, uh, rough substances from the flour and refining flour and having refined um, the luxury of having uh, uh, bread that's made with, with white flour. هناك المثل العربي المعروف في طلعة البدر ما يغنيك عن زحل فكل شيء من المأكولات له بدائل والبدائل أرقى وأنقى There is a saying in um, the ancient Arabic language that in, uh, when the moon shines, when the full moon shines then uh, the planet that is twinkling or, or shining, the tiny planet that is, or the star that is twinkling in the background, um, disappear. you don't need it anymore. You, you, you can take light from the moon and you don't need to take light from the stars. So um, all of the foods that are uh, harmful uh, or that can be harmful, such as flour, wheat flour, there are um, wonderful alternatives that we can uh, avail ourselves. Um, of with. Uh, one last thing I'll mention is, um, you know, to, to kind of help uh, uh, spread the benefit and the khair to everybody. Inshallah, we, 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 um, you know, we request from everybody, whoever uh, ends up uh, deciding to purchase um, a copy from Amazon to uh, please do leave a five-star review so that more people can benefit from it. Um, and the, the sphere of khair and barakah can expand. Um, and inshallah, you know, with that, we thank Imam Zaid and Abu Munir and uh, Sheikh Hamza for this very Mubarak event. Uh, Jazakum la khair, Ramadan to everybody. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Jazakum Allah khairan Sidi Imam Zaid. Jazakum Allah khairan ya Sidi Abu Munir. Sharaf Abuna wa Akram Tumuna. Astaghfirullah. Barakallah fi kum fi ma baqiya min Ramadan. Shahrul. Narju an. Ma'adham. Narju an nakum fi duaikum. Fi hadhi al ayyam al mubaraka. Ameen. والساعات القادمة من هذه الليالي وأن تدعو لنا ومن يسمعنا وإخواننا أن يدعو لنا في أمور أربع آمين الرضا عن الله سبحانه وتعالى وهذا ما كان خلق سيدنا الشيخ مصطفى رحمة الله عليه ويعني مادته الرضا عن الله سبحانه وتعالى وحب الله سبحانه وتعالى والفرح بالله سبحانه وتعالى وحسن الختام أربع أمور أطلب أستعطف منكم أن تدعو لنا بها لأنها أراها هي حل مشكلاتنا كلها آمين 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 فاجعلونا في دعائكم إخواننا اجعلونا في دعائهم في هذه الأمور وعسى أن يقول الملك لهم ولكم مثل ذلك فمن عنده مشكلة تذهب إذا حقق الله له هذه الأمور الأربع. سيدي إمام زيد، could you translate that and then we'll continue the challenge. Abu asked us to pray for for, for four things. Uh, one, which we emphasize as being one of the characteristics of Sheikh Mustafa that was deeply ingrained into the essence of his being, was being pleased with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Another was being pleased with Allah Himself. Uh, third and fourth, uh, I'm, I'm excited. I forgot the third and fourth. What were, what were the third and fourth, Sidi? The second one was, the first one was being pleased, al-mahabba, al-rida, al-mahabba, al-farah billah, and khusus uh, al-khitam. No, I'm a good ending, and, and to have a good ending, and to pray so, to pray for those four things, and all of us pray for them for each other. And, and ask whenever we pray for anything, and this is something uh, 
Ibn Rajab emphasizes in Lataf al Ma'arif, pray because these are times the prayers are answered, uh, but to pray for the pleasure of Allah and Jannah. Allahumma inna nasaluka ridaka wal Jannah. And to pray and to seek refuge from his anger and from the torment of hell. When a'udhu bika min saqatika wal nahr. So to pray for those four things and to ask Allah for these four, for ourselves and for each other. Bithnihi ta'ala. Barakallahu fikum wa bikum. We are to kabbal minkum. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Ayyadakum Allah. Hafizakum Allah. Wa ajra ala aydikum jami'an al khair. Wa nafa'a. وكذلك بكتابك وبحالك وبتأثيرك على الإخوان الذين بقي يعني يبقون هناك عندكم والذين لقد أثرت عليهم حينما حين إقامتك إقامتهم هناك في في عمان بارك الله فيكم ونسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يعني نؤثر أن نكون جميعا من من هؤلاء يؤثرون على غيرنا بفضل وتوفيق ورحمة وجود من الله سبحانه وتعالى وليس من أنفسنا وليس لأنفسنا وليس بأنفسنا ولكن كل وفلا ومع الله وعبد الله ومن الله وإلى الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله بارك الله بارك الله محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بارك الله فيكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته